I'd like to st I would like to just start, if you will, with just a kind of a blessing. Um, it's a very special workshop. So uh, it's, um, I think workshops just go down better. We're gonna be dealing with healing and I believe in the power of grace and healing. So hover over us, God. Bless this workshop and all who are in it. Amen. Now, I'm gonna just start for a second and say before I let Norm speak, uh, he's gonna say that's typical, but, <laughs> and just say that I consider it an unbelievable privilege to do a workshop with Norm. I have for years and years, he is the, he is for me a soulmate, a forever friend. I can't even go further than that or I'll start crying. So I consider it a privilege and everything that I do has begun with him. Everything has its roots with him. I consider it an honor to be able to teach with him and so uh, it is a privilege for you to have us both. So with that in mind, why don't you just introduce what you're doing here, other than hanging with me. I'm allowed to be here. <laughs> I have to tell my favorite story about Holland. Oh, Jesus. We were, in, we were, we were doing a workshop in the Netherlands, and this very proper, organized, super compulsive lady who's driving us to the Hague one evening. And she suddenly says, what are you talking about tonight? I said, oh, I guess we'll wing it as usual. She almost had a wreck. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about? But that's the way Carol and I have worked together for you know, all these years, since 1984. This isn't the time to tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, basically, when I met Carolyn, I knew that she was good as an intuitive. And I asked her how good, and of course she didn't know. But I tested her. And I tested a number of people. But Carolyn is unquestionably the most accurate. Now nobody's 100%, but 93% accurate on totally unknown situations is quite remarkable. And when she misses, it, it, it's like she just off that day. The other thing I learned is she can't do more than eight a day without beginning to lose it. But even so, we work together because of that mutual interest in looking at how do you help people who are not going to respond to conventional medicine. Now, long before I met Carolyn, I had come to the conclusion that acute medicine, you know, fresh illness, pretty good. American medicine is, is good. When it comes to chronic disease, that is, if it's not a lot better within a month, it's likely to be made worse chronically. And I came to that conclusion way back in the 60s. And so for that reason, for well over 40 years, I have looked at what can we do alternatively to help people get well again. And so we'll be talking about some of that stuff as the weekend progresses. Thank you. What I would like to do, you know, after 30 years dealing with health and healing, but not just health and healing, when I started out with Norm, it was to do medical intuitive, re it wasn't even to do, when I you don't, really 30, almost 31 years ago now, I was just trying to, I do energy, I didn't even know what I was doing, to be perfectly honest with you. I just had an ability to sense illness. And you, and you, you have to bear in mind, I was a, in publishing. And <clears throat> I think one of the greatest blessings of my life is that 
God gave me a genius for something I have no interest in and a, a passion for something I have no talent for. And the combination is itself a lesson in wisdom. Because what made me so good is not having an interest in what I do. Okay? Because I, I, I didn't have this sense of ruthless competition, which is so destructive. It's destructive. And the need to be recognized for what I was doing. I did not have that. I didn't have anyone to compete with. I had no interest in accomplishing anything in this field, and I think Norm can ver validate that. What I had an interest in achieving was something I had no talent for, which was becoming a brilliant fiction author. I have no talent, zero, none. <laughs> to this day, I fantasize about that great book that never seems to come. And in my, in my world, in my inner world, I think if I just do one more piece of nonfiction, if I teach one more workshop, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be rewarded with that great download that was made a Charles Dickens. But it never happens. And I'm not kidding you. That, that Catholic in me still operates at that reward and punishment level. I hate to own it, but it's the truth. Anyway, through the years, because I did not have a template and never heard of what I was doing, because I didn't know what I was doing, because I was simply accumulating in data, because I was simply ob observing, I was just, it, doing readings with Norm and getting to know a Dr. Sheely who was way in Springfield, Missouri and I was in New Hampshire. So you have to understand how this whole thing came about. And it wasn't until we wrote the book Creation of Health back in the 80s that I finally organized my own data and realized that I had formed patterns, I kind of noticed that there were patterns to illnesses. And that was the first time when I, you know, Norm and I wrote that book, which is still, I consider, a seminal work. That's when we organized the human energy system into a, a pretty good piece of work. That's when I started to pay attention to what we were doing. And I thought, we're doing something really substantial. It was at that point that I started to ask more sophisticated questions about healing, about human, our own energy system. I didn't take it that seriously until we wrote Creation of Health. And that's when I thought, well, how come people, you know, what makes us tick? So I'm going to hit a pause button here. I make a note that um, to the extent that we ask questions of depth, vigor, um, to the extent that you ask, you swallow a depth charge. That's the level of response that you're going to get. That's number one. Number two is so much depends on the uh, willingness you have to burrow in to how much you want to change your, your life. So I'm going to give you a, um, a very familiar, for those of you who have been with me before, you, 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 uh, uh, here. You've, you've seen me use this image, and it's a very simple one, but actually it's one that, that if you use this image and it sinks in, it's gonna, it makes more sense because this is really the way it is. You are essentially 
a, buildings don't move, but you're a building. And the only, build, the only movement in a building is inside. So this is you. And every floor offers a different view of the same reality that you live in, but you don't change. So someone living on the first floor has a completely different view of a reality than someone in the penthouse, even though you have the same address. And as you know with any building, every floor is more expensive. The mortgage gets higher. And you have to work harder to live on an upper floor. But the quality of life gets better. The air gets clearer. The vista gets broader. Everything about it gets better. It's more quiet. The tranquility increases. However, the higher you go, the less your neighbors want to hear about where you live. <laughs> the less you want to hear about where someone lives. You're no different. You are no different. I'm talking about you too. Okay, it's so, it's so interesting to me when, when people talk to me about like their marriage is disintegrating and they're not sure whether or not they want to stay married and they're unhappy. And I'll, I'll point out to them, your husband's probably telling someone the same thing right now. <gasps> I'm going home. <clears throat> I always think it's just them controlling the whole of the reality, as if it's a secret, as if the husband's perfectly happy, and it's all about them. OK, so here's what's true. As you go up every floor, your whole world changes. You see everything differently, but you're terrified of every floor. That's also the truth. And this is what, what's called, the, thank you, Cindy, the pursuit of truth. You are as drawn to every floor as you are terrified of it. Because once you get up to another floor, you can't deny what you see, however, it changes everything for you. You can't deny it, but you can't go back. And what I have learned is, and we're going to be working with this. Okay. You're going to be working with this, and this is what you are going to leave here knowing. There's an anatomy of your physical body. There's an anatomy of your energy or anatomy of your spirit. And there is an anatomy of your soul. All three work together. All three. And you need all three. The anatomy of your physical body is all of the, this is the anatomy that exists in your, in time and space. That's, that belongs in the first column. This is the anatomy that needs the vitamins and needs, and, and, and this is the part that you watch age. This is the part you have to pay attention to in terms of what you feed and this is the part that exists in the what we call time okay this is our time body our physical time body the anatomy of your spirit goes here in the middle now through the years of working with norm and then the, my mystical passage once I encountered my Teresa of Avila experience, and I returned to the depth of mysticism. The anatomy of energy, your energy body is where we get depth deeply into chakras and into your energy system. 
And this is where you, we, we will grapple with the impact of you in the world, your attraction to what's in the world, your magnetism to what is in the world, how you lose power in the world, your battle with illusions in the world, your character, your addictions, your need for things and your struggle for what is in the world. You experience that through energy, your loss of energy, your energetics, the management of the laws of energy. This is, this is you and your energetics. We were talking this morning, I was asking, oh, I need to just, as soon as I finish this, I want to introduce Jim for a minute. I just slipped right into my lecture. And I was just about to mention tribal. And that reminds me of that I slipped too fast into this, and I'm going to hit a pause button. You have a privilege of also participating with Jim Curtin this weekend. And I was just about to slip into tribal, which reminds me of the fact that I, I watched Lawrence of Arabia with Jim and that we talked about tribalism. And I'm going to go into that with you. And he said to me, this would have been a great movie through which to show the impact of tribalism and its psychic field which is your energy system. So before I go any further, Jim, stand up. J Jim has so much to tell about himself and his background, which I'm going to ask him to do right now, just a little bit, and go for it. You have the privilege of having movies with him. I'm sorry I slipped too fast into the class. Forgive me. Tell him who. Huh? Tell him who. Oh, uh, John Malkovich and Willem Dafoe and John Travolta and Patrick Swayze. That's and, and then I was diagnosed with cancer and I thought Carolyn was a healer. And I came to see her in Norm and she kidnapped me. <laughs> drove me away from a really solid, normal life. And uh, introduced me to a really paranormal life. <laughs> uh, she said to me, Who are you? And it hasn't stopped. So uh, she invited me to teach with her. And what I know is movies. And what I like to do is listen to Carolyn and Norm and then interpolate what they've said into my teaching of movies as well as some of the insights that I get about what's going on right now. So we're going to see a movie tonight and a movie tomorrow night, and I hope to be able to tell you by the end of the day what ones they're going to be, because that's, I brought about a half dozen. Um, so we'll see how it goes, and I'm over here if you have questions. Okay, thanks. And tragically, one of them will not be Lawrence of Arabia, but. Without a doubt, that was one of the most wonderful experiences. I said to Carolyn, if we had taught that, first of all, they would have died at first. And, <laughs> and second, we wouldn't have had time to teach class because it's the longest movie ever made. Ah, what a pleasure. <clears throat> okay, so continuing. What I, when I started, I did not know about the human energy system. Now I do, as you are. I think thanks to the work Norm and I did, everybody does now. And we articulated this and put it into its mate, the anat physical anatomical system. And so I want to go through that with you this weekend. But as I continue to work with it 
and added on um, ongoing research, I then began to kind of piece together the anatomy of the soul, which is, again, something that we're going to take a look at. Uh, here, we enter into a cosmic domain, the sacred domain. The part that is how I would define it now, how I would, I'm going to introduce it to you now to just give you a little sample of what's the distinction as I have witnessed it, and I will teach it to you, is that the knowledge of the physical body alone is just like studying a carcass. Unless you have the energy, mate, you're studying chemistry, you're studying physiology, all of which is, you need it, you need it. Just studying energy alone without the body, what good is that? This is a unity field. You have to have it all. I mean, the, the study of the body is magnificent. What a system. And in it, you discover the entire universe. You just start, you, it, this is what is, this is the wonder of, of heaven. Every system is in every system. Every system is in every system. There isn't anything you can go through and not discover the whole. But it's incomplete unless you put the whole into every system. Hmm? So, you study that you have the body, then the energy system, the energetics, what's in the chakras, what's it connected to. This is a type of energetic wiring, kind of a wiring. But what's missing here? And this is through the years when I would kind of look at things like, I don't get why people don't heal. I don't get why things aren't more effective. You know, when I started out way back in the 80s, of course, I don't look any older, <laughs> but um, there were so many things, you know, I was in New Hampshire and I was in publishing. We published books on spirituality, and, but way back then, one of the things that was really big was channeling. We published Seth with Jane Roberts and we published a lot, and honest to God, I had I, at one point on my desk, a manuscript that was like the autobiography of God. Who would do that? And I mean, the, the screwballs that I met back then. And <clears throat> it was really like a nut house. It was like a halfway house for the psychically afflicted. I mean, it was <laughs> like crazy. It was crazy. I'm telling you, people were channeling. People were, you know, getting things on the inner and outer and upper and downer. And who knows? I mean, it was, and, but it was an era being launched. It was an era that was literally a high, a high spiritually. People were high in the, in the 60s and in the 70s and in the mid-80s. It would turn as the 80s came to a close. We came down. But this was, people were still kind of on a high from the infusion of light that poured in in the 60s. People were high on the possibilities of what could be, of what we could be. They were sensing their spirit. They were sensing something electric in the air and they were, it was like a suit that had animated and they were trying it out. What can this do? What can this do? They were, pew, wiring was getting animated that had never been animated. Like, vroom, did you hear that? Vroom, I sensed something in you, but was uncontrollable. Everybody was a loose cannon on deck. Everybody was a loose cannon on deck. 
some people would get hits and those hits would be incredibly accurate and then they wouldn't have another hit for months. Some people would experience a capacity to help heal someone and in a peak for whatever chemistry came together. They would have a couple of months where they could help people heal and then it would vanish. It was a very extraordinary time of energy trying to come through people. People tried to do things to cooperate with new wiring that they knew was coming in. Well, would it change if I became a vegetarian? Would it change if I didn't wear leather? Would it change if I know I'll go organic? Everybody was organic in New England, where I lived in, in New Hampshire. Then they started to Birkenstock. <laughs> God, what ugly shoes. Make your feet look five times the size. And let's face it, that's not the most attractive part of anatomy. And then, um, you know, they decided to meditate and they always fell asleep and fell over. <laughs> that didn't work. So anything, anything at all. And I remember going to, you know, then of course maybe yoga would help the wiring. Well, perhaps marijuana. You know, if this doesn't work, let's try drugs. You know, mushrooms, pickles, anything, <laughs> you know. I mean, it was anything to try and get the energy focused. Because we could feel we were different. Something was different about us. But we couldn't quite name it. In the meantime, we were becoming susceptible to different things in the air. That was also true. Our illnesses were evolving along with our wiring. We were evolving sensitivities. We were evolving in our sensitive nature. Now, when I started my observations here, I was, I was fascinated by absolutely everything because when I popped in on the scene, I was at the, it was at the stage where people were very optimistic about the attitude that two a couple of prevalent thoughts were main on the stream at this point. One, we create our own reality was very vogue. And two was, I created this cancer or I created this disease and therefore I can heal myself. Well, that was really fascinating because in the meantime, my wiring is popping up. And I, and I meet a, a gentleman who is a neurosurgeon from Harvard. That's big credential, big, huge. Now, if I hadn't met a psychiatrist from California, I'd be sunk because they're lunatics, okay? And nobody respects psychiatrists when it comes to studying things like alternative states of consciousness. They are an alternative state of consciousness. <laughs> Do I have any psychiatrists in the room? <laughs> serious, am I serious? Okay. But you know what I'm saying. But I have a major league brain surgeon from a major league Eastern University, the best. And he's interested in people like me. I'm not even interested in people like me. <laughs> okay, so now we start doing this research on people and we're moving at a pretty fast pace. For years and years and years, I stayed in New Hampshire and did readings Every day. We, we've done thousands of readings. I never took a vacation, ever, right? I mean, I do readings and readings and readings per day. Never took a vacation. Lived all alone in the mountains. So, you know, when someone says, I want to be good, I'm like, 
you have no idea what it takes. And I don't say that like, duh, duh, duh. I say that like, ask anyone who's superb at their craft, whether it's science or being a superb musician or being a superb athlete, and ask them how hard they worked. And then ask them if a weekend workshop in what they do would get them there. And watch the look they'll give you. Okay? That's the look I'm going to give you if you think you're going to come out at the end of this weekend a superb medical intuitive. Are we in agreement here? <laughs>